Hi, I'm Matt Allard, and we're at the ACS headquarters here in North Sydney, and I'm with the ACS Technical Committee, or two members of the ACS Technical Committee, Tom Gleeson and Ben Allen. Now, we're, today we're going to be discussing all things FX9. Yes. Uh, you guys have been involved in testing out the FX9, going through it, doing some yep. tests. Yep. Um, Tom, initial impressions. Well, let, let me first, um, a few thanks. Um, the Technical Committee is made up by a bunch of people, and um, I'd like to thank Susan Lumson. Um, Alexi Vanamoire, Nido Tamburi, Dragon Studios were a big help. Carl Jenner's helping us out. Uh, and, Pal Akhtel. And we have our amazing Pal Akhtel, our, our cinematographer scientist, um, who's also helping us out. So um, all this work is a, a bunch of people. Fantastic team effort. Yeah. It's, yeah. FX9 is a complex, complex camera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I, I do believe the nature of all digital cinema cameras now are incredibly complex beasts. So I, I have no idea, but I imagine the uh, this team at Sony that builds the FX9, there would be dozens and dozens of engineers, scientists, technicians, software. It, it could be a hundred people spend, working for years. Yeah. And you could spend weeks testing this cam this any camera of this kind of complexity. You could spend weeks testing it and yeah. still have stuff that you haven't uncovered. So, what we're looking at is we've identified some key parameters that we wanted to look at and, and really hone in on, okay, let's benchmark them to a certain point and, yeah. and do that in a quantifiable way. Yeah, and partly in the context of the FS7. Yes. In yeah. other words, the, the, the FX9, um, what is that going to give you over the FS7? Um, we were chatting to Matt earlier and saying uh, the FS7 has proven to be, I think, the world's most popular Super 35 cinema camera. And so it's a very familiar kind of point of reference as a, as a starting point for, okay, this is something that a lot of people know very well. And so if we, if we benchmark our tests to yeah. that starting point, then that gives you guys something to kind of know, okay, well, if this is how the FS7 is performing and this is how the FX9 is performing relative to that, yes. then it's something we can kind of understand. What we thought we'd do is camera exposure latitude test. So how much correctable latitude is there in the images uh, with certain parameters. And so we're comparing the FS7 in 2000 ISO, uh, its native ISO. Uh, we didn't have time to test both base ISOs. This is the dual base ISO in the FX9, so we went with the 800 and and just went, looked at the over and under exposures there side okay. by side. So what you're, you, you'll see Shall we play? Here. Well, let's play. And so we'll see the at each point the FS7 first. Uh, so this is shooting S log three, S gamut three, three. cine with the, the S log LCA LUT, which is the one that I think most people like. And you're not changing any parameters here. And, and, and what we're seeing, I think, is this is like Sorry, straight out of the camera and then they turn and then you're doing a correction based on correct exposure. That's right, yes. So they, yeah, turn away and then we as they turn back, we dissolve to the corrected image and so that correction is is a very simple exposure correction happening with printer lights in resolve underneath the LUT so it's not happening after the the rec 709 conversion it's happening in log space and so you've look. chosen two models here with different skin tones and you've got someone with a glittery top and and uh, so and what, what are we actually what should people actually be looking here so for? what we're looking for here is how the contrast changes any sh color shifts uh, the noise changes uh, and uh, how the skin tones are rendered most particularly. And so we're looking for how, where, where we see any kind of breakup or clipping in overexposure and uh, loss of tonal values in underexposure. Now, were you expecting that both of these cameras can, were going to look fairly similar or did you have sort of an open mind going in that maybe it's, the FX9 is going to be completely different to the FS7? I think, you know, we, we definitely went in with an open mind, but with the theory that they were going to have a lot in common um, yeah. because there's you know, such a similar de design philosophy behind both cameras. And, and I think Sony would deliberately not take the look too far away. Yeah, yeah. The, the camera's got to sit within a family of other cameras and yeah. there'll be shoots mixing FS7s and FX9s. I mean, you can certainly spot the difference. There is a difference for sure. And and certainly the difference in the colour space uh, is real. Like Sony's talking about that it's, it's taking a lot of the colour science from the Venice and I think that's quite visible. It's not um, not just marketing speak. So, we're so four, four stops, stops over. over and it's... That's clearly uncorrected. It's vastly over, and correcting back that still looks quite normal. 
to my eye. It's pretty good. Now, bearing in mind the actress on the right has light skin and is slightly closer to the lamp, so she's probably a third of a stop over on reflected values. And still correcting back. Okay, nice. We're starting to get some... Yeah, break up here. Yeah. Some clip, I should say. And at four and two thirds of a stop... It's on. I mean, that's a long way over. Yeah. And I think that's really... So how would you compare this to, to other digital cinema cameras that are on the market in terms of how much you can overexpose? I, I think it's, it's up there with most of the kind of the benchmark cameras to my eye. What do you reckon, Tom? That's a hard one, um, but um, it's, it, it's very good. Yeah. And at five stops over, I think both cameras are, are very much broken. They're um, on... You're starting to really lose tonal separation as well as the highlights clipping. But even if you look at the darker skin tone, it's a little bit further away from the, the light. There's still some some real harshness in the highlights there on her. Is there any sort of colour tone difference between the FS7 and FX9? Yeah, the FS7 tends a little bit more to magenta and the FX9 tends a little bit more towards green. Mm -hmm. You know, They are both on preset white balance using the same lens, so that those are tendencies in the cameras themselves which we've balanced out a little bit yeah and, and i will add with the lighting we, we use a mixture of sources um we use one small hmi and a bunch of different brand leds yeah all through one large frame and, and in grading this up i i, I th think they look quite good like yep. they balance out quite well okay two stops under i think both cameras are really performing quite well still yep so at four stops over and two stops under both cameras are very comfortable. And so yep. it's, you've got a six-stop range there where if you can't get it within six stops, you've probably got bigger problems yes. than which Although, camera. Although you should be it, choosing it, a different occupation. Yes, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. H having said that, of course, the test is not so much about... Mm. It, it's, it's the nature of many shots which have yeah. such extreme ranges within a them. Absolutely, You yeah. have to make that yep. call. Yes, yeah. So this is, this, is the, this is the space you can play in. Yes, yes. Um, so three stops under on both cameras, you, you're really starting to push them. So interestingly, um, against the early digital cameras, which really were biased towards shadows, mm. um, like most digital cinema cameras now, these cameras are weighted much more to favour the highlights. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you've got a lot more latitude in the highlights than in the shadows, um, like film. So how would you summarise the improvement in I, the... What I'm seeing there is much tighter, finer grain on the FX9. So it's, yep. to my eye, it's a similar amount of grain, but the grain's smaller. Yeah, and you use the word grain yes, in place yes, of noise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Technically, of course, we're talking about noise. Stretch out this contrast here in these, these underexposed shots to get a much better looking image. But what we wanted to really see here is how the underexposure is affecting the contrast and how much you lose yeah. it there. So that's, um, you know, I thought the results of that were not far off what we were expecting and yeah. I guess hoping that it yeah. would be a similar range to the, the FS7, um, a little bit better, particularly in underexposure, which is exactly what Big we thing. saw and, and very useful and, the, you know, a little bit nicer noise i think it's it's finer noise and it's a little bit nicer on the eye than the the fx uh, mm -hmm. the fs7 which does get very chunky when very you quickly quite, quite yeah quite quickly so dynamic range between the fs7 and fx9 fairly similar i would say similar dynamic range the total dynamic range i think is very similar between these two cameras i would say the usable dynamic range on the fx9 is slightly bigger within that and that's a much more important thing, actually, the usable dynamic range, not just the number. It's the only really thing that matters. <laughs> interesting number, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So would you you give can it argue all day about total dynamic range. Yeah, whether and it's, it's always a tough call. Yeah. Um, would, you, would you give the, F, uh, the FX9 a stop over the FS7 in the yeah, shadows? Yeah, a stop, stop and a half maybe stop in the shadows. Half. Okay. Yeah, and very similar in the highlights. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's Which, a, yeah, is great. That's a huge improvement, yeah, yeah, really, yeah. for a single generation from a, of camera. From a very usable base. Okay, there. okay. Um, so, shall we have a look um, and play now some of our dual ISO tests? Yeah, yeah. Where we took advantage of the um, 4000 ASA and compared that to 800 ASA. We created a scenario of a typical, uh, typical shoot where you've got an interview with someone you need to have a chat with. 
First one is the FX9. We're on a 50. We're using the Cine EI uh, S Log 3 at 800 ASA. Incredibly clean picture here. This is no LUT applied. Here we are with uh, instead using S Cine Tone. So we've gone out of Cine EI mode and we're in the 800. The interesting thing about the S Cine Tone is it's effectively like shooting S Log with a LUT baked in. Yes. So this is more for if you want to turn around material quickly where Absolutely, no one's yeah. going to bother grading. Yeah. And as a it's a really good compromise. Yeah, and as a comparison, here's 709. Which is definitely harsher. So yeah. the, the S Cine Tones. I like the Cine Tone. A lot better roll off. Yeah. Uh, and I think better skin tones. He's handsome. Now, do all these profiles have different base ISO levels? Yes, um, we'll come back to that, Matt, because that's that's a um, mind. I won't use the word. Uh, <laughs> see, but, it's a mind thing. But have a look at this FS7 and the difference in the way it shows the skin tones. Yeah, and, and I think that's tones. where we're seeing the Venice color science coming into play on the skin tones. There, and it's... here we are now. We've bumped to four thousand ASA. And I see, to my eye, no color difference. I wouldn't pick it. If, and no if noise I was looking at it in the grade, I yeah. wouldn't pick which was yeah, which. I couldn't pick the 800 when I was um, doing the footage. Now, here's uh, FS7. It at 4,000 ASA. Does a bit better than I thought it would. Beginning to see noise. But uh, Cine Tone now. And in the Cine Tone mode, it will gain up the picture. So we've now gone to 8,000 ASA. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's clean. That is utterly, utterly usable. In 4K. In 4K, yes. And here's our FS7, beginning to show the pressure. You can see that noise building up. Again, when we shot this stuff, there's a good strong exposure going down onto the sensor here. Yeah. Does it automatically switch between the two different base ISOs or do you have to physically actually go into the menu and change it from low I think high. you can um, put it onto a button if you would. There's a whole bunch of configurable buttons. Mm. Um, it's not a button I would probably have configured because I'd want to be able to dig in because I don't want to accidentally be pressing that button all the time. Um, but again, here's our Cinetone 12800 ASA. Oh, my God. Uh, we did a couple of versions. Yeah. This is with a little tiny bit of um, Final Cut um, noise reduction. But here's the internal noise reduction. And there's no penalty in that. I can't see any plasticizing in the skin it's or the face. That's 12,800 ASA. The most appealing thing about this camera is this autofocus for, it, for this exact situation. It's a huge interviews. thing. Um, I know autofocus is not new. Yeah. Um, I know Canon has been a pioneer in, in this field, uh, but autofocus as done in this camera is yep. the beginning, I think, in some ways of autofocus truly becoming the revolution that needs to be uh, you know this is a full frame camera and the evf in this camera is a step up from the fs7 yep. no question it's now a 1280p evf uh which is not shabby but it's not brilliant um, it, it'd be hard to be manually pulling focus through the lens at, with this kind of depth of field yes very hard yep. and 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 for it to actually be accurate when you yeah, when yeah. you're dealing with 4k yeah yep. uh but the, and for the sort of the one man band owner operator who's likely to buy an FX9, I mean, that's a lot of a times you're going to be in a situation in a room which exactly. you don't have a lot of time to light, you don't have a lot of time to control things. Yeah, so yeah. you'd probably want to run shallow depth of field in a lot of circumstances exactly. because you don't yeah. want to see the background because it's ugly or it's, you can't do anything with it's it. It's a situation this camera is going to end up in a lot. Yeah. I, I will add, with that low light capability and the ability to run really fast primes at 1.4. You can be in scenarios where the levels of light, Very the light normal. can be handsome, it can be a lovely soft source, yep. but no longer needs to be a bright source. But the autofocus um, is also um, incredibly configurable. You can change the speed with which the autofocus changes. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different modes. My favorite mode is um, uh, if I was doing a documentary, I can controlling the focus on the focus ring, but I can tell the camera to pop the focus to the nearest thing I focus to. So if I pull focus between two faces, but I've actually missed by two centimetres and I'm, I'm on the ear, not the eyes, I'm going to struggle to see that in my little 1280 viewfinder. But the camera is going to go, oh, you've just a bit buzzed there. Boop. And it's going to put it across through to the eyes. Or even if I pull focus yeah. to an object and I'm not quite there, the camera's smart enough to go, 
Well, he's taking the focus 99% of the there. I'm he probably the wants 1%. it there. Yeah. And the camera can pop there. So I'm totally in control of this focus as per manual ring. But if I'm just off, the camera's going it. to take control. Yeah. Uh, look, we, won't, we can't go into the autofocus because it is such a complex thing. You can spend a lot of time talking about yeah. all the variables. Uh, is, is there times where it doesn't work? Oh, without doubt. Without doubt. And we, we or, couldn't or break mo- it. Or modes specifically. Absolutely. We didn't test it sufficiently to see where those points are breaking. And I'm not quite sure in the hurly-burly of a... A kind of reality gun, show yeah. documentary style bun fight where you have no idea what's going to happen. How useful would always be, but there is a thumbstick control and zone control. So I can be, we can have an intro to two of you and I can just flick across and make sure it's on the right hand side. I can do incredible things like tell the camera, focus on Matt, ignore Ben and Tom. So it'll recognise your face over my face and Ben's face. So if you were doing up to eight people, yeah, if you were doing a reality show or even a drama for that matter, mm. but definitely in a reality show where there's unpredictable stuff going on, and your camera was dedicated to following Matt, yeah, then you'd lock it onto his face, and no matter what's going on in the frame, yeah, it's going to prioritise him. That's, that's a great the sheer configurable nature yeah. of the autofocus probably makes it equally as handy for drama because you can set it up specifically Absolutely. for each yeah. shot. So you want the focus puller and go, well, okay, well, this mode's going to work best here. I might, I might take control at this point yep. of the focus over. Yeah. Autofocus, you never want to make the mistake that autofocus will focus the camera for you. It's still your job to tell the camera what needs to be in focus. The yep. camera's only just making sure it is in focus and there will be obviously so it's creative not, moments yeah. where... You don't want stuff in focus. Yeah. So, and, and also, it's not idiot-proof. It's just a tool that gives you a lot of power and a lot of options. If I was in a drama, it can just save me one take in every setup. Yeah, yeah. If, even there are there are one in a hundred. Well, one in a hundred. There are individual focus pullers who can nail everything. Yeah. They have magic in their fingers. I don't know how they do it. They're weirdos. And they get the big bucks. For they get the big bucks. <laughs> Absolutely, they do get the big bucks. They Absolutely, do. for that reason. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to get. Those guys, and I work with a lot of very talented um, focus pullers, mm. but, you know, they, they, they often need some uh, – do a run, do a practice. Okay, you're going to be there. This is going to happen. Yep. There's a lot, a lot of work. If, if, if alternative, we can go, okay, lock on to this guy. Yeah. I want him sharp. Um, he's a star. And it happens – then so for, for low nice budget if there drama. was a system where it was something was built into the actual lens in the future from Sony where a focus puller could actually directly communicate with Absolutely. the lens instead of I, having to go through a focus. I mean, what you're talking about is combining a lot of existing technology there into that, which yes. I think would be You'd fantastic. You'd have the best of both worlds. Yeah, you yeah. absolutely would. That would be Venice great. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I have no idea, I have no connection to Sony at all, that this technology is being trialled in the FX9 and the, the, that technology will come to Hopefully, a camera like the Venice, like a Venice sensor. Mark II. As a cinematographer, you can choose to use it. You can choose not to. Yeah. But if you've got a focus pull, a man running down the corridor and la la, and it's going to be um, yeah, a tough one, and the focus pull and go, lock onto that guy, yeah. and we do it, and the first take, it's done, then I, I, I the don't think many cinematographers are going to fight it. Take. Yeah. If it's on the first take and the 51st take. Yeah, it's, it won't know, replace a focus puller. No, but... But yeah. Working with a focus puller it yeah. takes it to a whole different level. I actually think it's one of the most exciting things in this camera. Yeah, for the totally industry. agree with that. Yeah. 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 So tests are all good and well, but people want to actually see footage and you yes. actually went out with the camera and shot in yes. some quite challenging conditions. Yes. Where um, did you go and what did you shoot? Well, we thought, let's find a high contrast, difficult scene. Um, so, of course, being in Australia, we went to the beach. Uh, we went down at pre-dawn. So we wanted to see what this 4000 ASA would look like. Um, so we started the shoot before the sun um, had risen. And when you've got that lovely pre-golden hour tw- um, early light, yeah, yeah. and then once the strange sun comes up, <laughs> you've suddenly got a nuclear reactor blasting um, at you. And so we thought we took no reflectors, not even a flexi fill. We'll, we'll play the video. Um, I, I will add that the uh, camera in its present state if you go to S and Q mode, which is Sony's off speed, off, weird off speed thing, um, you're in 2K. Yeah. Most people will be shooting right across the sensor, but supply 1920 to 1080. Going to the slow mo, uh, 
in the 2K mode, it is still using the whole sensor and just yes. most importantly down resing that Not rather a big than crop cropping. And used to. Yes, so, yes. Yeah, I, so okay, yeah. well, let's, let's have a let's look. Have a look at this test. You can see at the beginning here we're pre-dawn. We're in 4,000 ASO. Um, so that's a very low light level. Yes, and we are in Cine EI mode mm, mm. here. You can see in this shot, all the lights of the houses are still on. So what frame playing. rate are you at here? Um, we're good, Ben. <laughs> I think we shot this whole, every single shot's at 60 frames. Yeah. Which, for shooting people, is a nice, is frame. A nice frame rate. Yeah, like yeah. Much above 60 frames, human movement starts to take on a weird Or begins to come thing. boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, unless yeah. someone's doing something incredibly athletic. Like, if you're talking about macro stuff, then... Sure, higher Absolutely. frame rates, and great, it, but for shooting this kind of stuff... Water 60, explosions, yeah, you yeah, can certainly yeah, go yeah, faster. Yeah. So I think the 4K rates for the um, camera will be in that 50, 60 range. Um, and these are pretty high dynamic range scenes. If oh, you've huge. Got Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. the highlight roll-off on, on the sun there is really quite nice. subtle. Uh, I will add all these footage has been put into Resolve. Yep. Um, I did the grade myself, so I apologise for that because there's... People more talented than me. I think um, it looks very presentable. Uh, but so I've pulled some of these shadows up to just yeah, see what's yeah. in there. Uh, when you do pull them up, you do see that, as you mentioned, you do sometimes see some noise. But again, it's that kind of finer grain noise, which is just visually quite acceptable. Yeah. And you could argue, in many productions that I've worked on, we've done beautiful clean pictures and then we've added. Uh, yeah, We've added yeah, the grain, film like look, grain. There's plenty know. of big blockbuster films. Absolutely, yeah. At this point in time, are uh, adding a fine grain. Yeah, it adds an organic value yeah. that has an aesthetic value. Yes, yeah. Um, but so here we got the sun directly a on her face. Um, I think we did. I did crank the camera to absolute maximum here. I'd have to go back to the metadata, uh, but it's probably seventy-five to hundred. And skin tones are looking nice. And, Absolutely. And the lips are actually looking like a correct sort of colour of yeah. red, which was a problem with previous Sony cameras. Absolutely. And I will add, when I've done the great, I've done nothing with the skin tones. Nothing. Wow. That's, um, I've just filled with exposure to make sure it fits in, pulled some highlights down, brought some shadows up. So to me, those images are more indicative of a higher budget, mm. uh, wrong word, uh, more sophisticated cinema cameras. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I wouldn't pick that as a cheapy. I definitely uh, wouldn't. I'm loath to call the FX9 a, a cheapy camera because <laughs> it will be, I think, around eleven thousand US or eighteen thousand Australian dollars. But, but still... it's a completely different ballpark to the very high end cameras. Absolutely, and, and I, I will add, only two years ago, I think Red came out with a full frame camera. Yeah. And we're talking serious money then. Ari followed with the LF only a year ago. One year later, Sony has a full frame camera in this budget range. Yeah, yeah, which is amazingly impressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, th three years ago, you couldn't get that kind of quality in full frame with those kind of features. If this camera no was released three years ago, it would have been a, one of the top line cinema cameras. Easily, maybe five years ago, but yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's a big step forward. I will let, you can have a look at some of these pictures, and I, I have asked this question to Sony, and maybe this will be irrelevant by the end. We were getting this weird purple highlighting. Um, it is recorded into the, in the log footage. Uh, I'm not sure what that highlight sparkle is. I exposed this shot uh, because the sun had come up, and it was very bright, uh, so I exposed for the sun, but then she walks through the shade. But I've used this bit because it really shows what the camera can do with under. Yep. That's with the straight LUT, cine tone. Dropped on it. And then the next shot we see with a grade lifting it up. So we are stops and stops and stops under here. Yeah, yeah. And it, does it break up? Is it noisy? Yes, yes, yes. But dang, that's... Yeah, that's it's very watchable. It's it's at a pinch. Yeah, yeah. It you, at a pinch usable. If that was yeah, an yeah. important, important shot, you, you'd, I know editors would go with it. Yes. If that was the golden moment. Yep. And I will add, in terms of our focus, that was all manual focus, which I focused by eye using the Sony viewfinder. And 
That's so was that, able that to is, nail most of it. Yeah. Um, we were two eights, but two eight on a full frame camera is <laughs> it's not yeah, a lot of depth of field. doesn't work in SNQ. Ah, right? yes, good point, Matt. Yes, nothing works in SNQ. <laughs> um, so uh, when I say that, at, in SNQ modes, you're losing, I think, almost all the auto, including auto iris. I think I better double check that. Auto iris, auto focus, auto shutter. Yeah. Um, you're on your own. I'm not sure. All the processing, the power, Probably the processing camera. limitation of the camera. Yeah, can't. I do suspect so. Mm. Could possibly change with um, firmware updates. I don't know. Mm. Um, Sony has made a lot of promises to keep this camera updated, and there's a whole list we might in, try and include at the end of the video yep. of of what that schedule is going to be. But at the moment, in SNQ mode, because autofocus in SNQ would be awesome. Who knows? Yeah. All right. Uh, so what should we look at next? Ergonomics, I guess. I mean, you've just, shot, just shown vision that you've shot with it. How easy was it yeah. to actually shoot that material? Um, the camera is super lightweight. So yeah. that's, that's fabulous, no question. But very similar to the FS7, it is a front-weighted camera. The back of the camera sits on your shoulder and comes forward. If you're using um, lightweight lenses, uh, that's not really problematic. But, you know, if you're putting on bigger and heavier lenses, um, you've got that front-weight issue. It is all sitting. It, it, it is all Absolutely. front. Yeah. And yeah. You've got, you do have that lovely Sony handle, which is great. I, I will add they've not fixed the design of that. So um, uh, if you put the camera down, the camera will you can't sit, sit on flat. the ground. Yeah. It really should have a push button that you could just flick that thing up. Yeah. That would be nice. And I think Shape and a few others make that as third party. Mm. Um, I If I was a personal owner, I would have the V-Lock adapter, yeah. put some weight at the back. Especially like if, you, if you're going to shoot a lot of handheld with it, that would make a world of difference. Yes. Just having it positioned a bit better and the, the balance at the back. And this is really is the sort of camera that's going to be used a lot handheld. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, with the kit lens, it's all still nice and lightweight, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, ergonomics in terms of using the camera, oh, my God, I suppose we have to go there. Sony menus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have I improved. read a 400-page manual. Improved. <laughs> uh, and I managed not to bash my head against the wall. Uh, I understand it's an owner operator camera. So if you're a, if you buy an FX9, not you will get to know it and you will find your way around that menu pretty comfortably. You will learn. Having said that, when we were doing the test, there were moments when there was six of us fairly nerdy cinematographers standing around going, "How okay, do we how do, do we do X?" Uh, yes. Yeah. Sony does allow you to build a user menu. Yes. So you can put your top 10 in. There are a whole bunch of buttons that are all configurable. So you can go a long way into sorting it out. You would never want to rent an FX9 and pick it up and think you could go. Having said that, um, you can build a configuration for an FX9, put it on an SD card, hmm. pick up a rental in a country, drop a card in, Bang, it's your camera. That's right. So if you're coming from that FS7 background and you know the FS7 menu system, then you're going to transition to yeah. the FX9 pretty easily. Look, <coughs> if you're coming from a Venice or an F55 or an F5... I, I, I will say in Sony's defence, um, they give you a tremendous amount of power in that menu system. These, that camera mm. is... We have touched the surface. The networking... Barely, yeah. The, um, the ability for that camera to be configure, configured remotely yep. there's just a whole bunch of amazing stuff um the proxies can be downloaded over the net as you shoot yeah uh but with that power comes responsibility mm. and complexity yes sony just stuff some things up like <laughs> um the cine tone which is wonderful it's a yeah. lovely lot um it's a great for those for the guys who want to hand over footage all prepared but yeah. sony don't so call it cine tone in a menu it's called original See, that's, that's odd. What is original? So that forces you back to the man. You're going, what the? I mean, once you know. You know. You know. But it's like, yeah. why? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I look, they have made an effort with the menus, uh, but it, it'd be it's, very there's hard a, to. There's a, there's a thing with the, the Sony menus where it often feels like they're avoiding saying something directly. It's yeah. always euphemism. Yeah. So, like original. They invent new Just words. Just tell us it's cinetone, it's cinetone. Yeah. But look, uh, um, again, you, know, you wouldn't want to give a fail. As, and certainly if you're a professional cinematographer, you are beholden, any camera you pick up, to 
read a manual, yeah. understand how it works, shoot some tests, prep it before you get to the shoot, yeah. <laughs> not so when you, you get there. For example, if you're going to shoot a doco over six weeks with this camera and you had a day of prep with it, you'd be fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A day of prep and some tests. Yes. Absolutely. Do some stuff, stick it in, make sure you're happy. It would be lovely to see a Venice style system where there was a simple user menu, which yeah, yeah. ASA, shutter speed, all the things that photographer, cinematographer is going to use on a shot by shot basis, sitting up front of a menu system with all the complexity sitting behind. That when you need the it, the more expensive you dig it. the camera is, the easier it is to use. Yeah, <laughs> that's the irony. No of, yes, yes, that's yes. the irony of where we are in 2019. That you pay a premium for simplicity, mm. um, and, and you know, not just in Sony across the brands, there is yeah. a premium for a simple Ari, to operate yeah, 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 camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, in terms of inputs outputs, two of the big new additions to the FX9 time code and Genlock. Yes, fantastic. All built a in. A lot of FS. You don't need an adapter. About. We got some disadvantages. You can't control. The LUT on the different outputs now, for some mm. reason. Again, yeah. maybe firmware could be fixing firmware. So it's what we talked a bit earlier. Um, this is a camera built on a budget. It's also built to fit within a, a family line of other cameras. And it inevitably has some limitations, whether they be technical or whether for other reasons. And the camera mm. can't do certain things. So the FX9 is capable of superb performance and a lot of things. But there are points, a whole series of points, camera speed being one of them, where this All camera this hits the headroom. Yeah, it's you know it, it is built to fit in their spectrum of cameras, and yeah. and and when you look at it in that, you know this is a big step up from the FS7 Mark II. Yeah, and it's a vastly cheaper camera than the Venice. Yeah, those compromises make. Anamorphic a lot of sense. is probably the best example of that. Yeah, this is yeah. a camera being a full frame sensor is utterly utterly capable of being anamorphic because it's got the full height it's yeah, a perfect yeah. camera sony yeah. camera to be shooting anamorphic sony's chosen not to put it in yes and so that, you that could shoot anamorphic on there you just can't de-squeeze it de-squeeze it do in, your head internally in. you have tried to use it. an next <laughs> 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 well if you had a monitor maybe if you had a monitor um, yeah. but that was a conscious choice on their part and look at oh, oh, i have to question how many fx9 users would want to put anamorphic glass i would say on a lot shoot. want to um, but the reality of actually doing it yeah. is a whole oh, different yeah. thing. Having said, there's a whole bunch of super cheap anamorphic glass heading our way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, it's, it's probably going to happen. And Sony could change. Yes, yeah. And it is the kind of thing that could change in a firmware update. And no, no, if they made no that choice, six, no six K recording. That's probably the thing people are going to complain about. Whether they actually need it's another thing. Yeah. Look, my take on it, and I know we some people see differently. I think for the for the users of this camera. The 6K to 4K output is a good thing. You mm. get, in some ways, the best of both worlds. You get that wonderful oversampling from 6K. And I will add, you clearly see between the FS7 and the FX9, when you flick between the images, the clarity that that 6K sensor gives the image over the FS7. And that there you're really looking at the way that the Bayer pattern sensor works, having that oversampling is vastly more significant than it Absolutely. sounds at first glance. Um, now, some would argue, well, why can't we have access to that full 6K? But to be totally honest, the camera is doing a good a good job of downsampling you to 4K. With a 6K camera, you've probably mm. only got around 4K resolution anyway, maybe a bit more. I mean, uh, but by getting 4K, your file sizes are reasonable. Um, it's more manageable. I You're think with only the giving away yeah, a li you are yeah, giving yeah. away something, no yeah. question. But f I think ninety percent of people they're not leveraging that extra. Definitely, and I think for the internal recording that makes so much sense. I think it's a really sensible thing that they've done with yeah. the internal recording to keep that to four K. Also, because the workflow matches the FS seven. Yes. So you people don't need to over. reinvent any workflow there. Yeah. So that I think makes perfect sense. Where I'm struggling a little bit with the logic is that the raw, raw recording is also going to downsample to 4K. Now, maybe that will work brilliantly. I'm going to reserve judgment on that till I yes. see it. I am struggling a bit with the logic of that. I'm not yeah. sure I, I, why. I mean, the FS7 was a mid-tier bread and butter workhorse camera. Yes. And yeah. I think for the majority of people who were using it, the type of internal recording they were doing. I mean, I don't know how many people were actually shooting raw on an FS7 or FS7 Good Mark question. II. Probably, yeah. probably not many. Not many. Yeah. And probably most people are probably still delivering in HD. Yes. So I think Sony have probably done the right thing. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just come out with something that is 
I think upgraded so. and offers a few more advantages over an FS7 yeah. Mark II. Um, yeah. the, the, the Royal Recorder may offer some advantages. I certainly, uh, I will add, if you pixel peep on the FX9 footage, you see that clearly see the processing this camera is doing, mm. and the nature of the XAVC codec. If yeah. you pixel peep, yeah. Um, uh, if you use the Raw Recorder, or you need the adapter, then you need to buy a separate rec third-party recorder. So have what this all adds up to be. Is unknown it's, it's, at this stage. Yeah, but it's not a bargain solution for RAW. Yeah, and you'll end up, I think, with a higher bit um, bit depth. Yeah. Uh, what it's all going to be, I'm not 100 percent certain. Mm. I'm not. I don't know if it's going to be really worth. I think once you've got all that palaver, just upgrade the camera. Go to a Venice. And bigger, better camera for that job. If uh, if you're going to make a movie, shoot a film, uh, and it was VFX heavy, you'd be not using an FX9. Yeah. That would not yeah. be. The it smart. would be a stretch. Yeah, the VFX people would would. Um, thump you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but for a lot of other things, I mean, I've got a job possibly where I have to go into a third world country to shoot a drama. Mm. Um, I'm a personal owner of a Red Monstro. I love the camera. It's a beautiful camera. The thought of running that camera in a third world country where even power is an issue yeah. uh, makes me look at the FX9 and think, oh my God. There's a lot to like. I, yeah, yeah, there's a lot. This is a practical utility. Long battery run times, long media run times, very yep. crucial for flexibility with lenses. Yeah. It's yeah. untested, but I don't think anyone would challenge Sony reliability. Mm. They know how to build tough, tough cameras that They've go been on a long and time. on. They might look yeah. a bit plasticky, yeah. but I, I don't think you'd want to underestimate Sony's not depth of engineering knowledge in building reliable machines. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, they're good. Yeah. So another way I can imagine the FX9 being used very successfully is say on a bigger production where Venice is your A camera and you want to have uh, something to poke into a tight spot not that the Venice is a big camera but in, in if you've got it fully configured as yeah. your A camera to have something that's lightweight and small to poke into a tight spot or to put on a gimbal and yeah. even on a bigger production to be able to run from your A camera to suddenly you've got the, the FX9. Autofocus if someone has to do it exactly, by themselves. Exactly, yeah, you've got it with absolutely. the autofocus on there and maybe your B camera operator is just running with that while your focus pull is on A camera. I can imagine a lot of productions would find that incredibly useful to be able oh. to... At, or at even just, someone, you know, doing two camera sit down interviews yeah, by yeah. themselves, where they have to lock one camera off, the ability to have the auto focus on there, exactly. just go and set and forget. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to have a look at a, a very technical test. Now this yeah. is designed to show how well a camera's sensor reacts to certain colours. Yeah. So this is a test. Uh, we we got Powell Actel to to do this test. A lot of people talk about colour science. Powell actually is a scientist. He's got a PhD in this stuff, and he has a, a tool. Uh, for it's designed specifically for doing this, and it breaks up the light into its component parts, and so uh, it's seeing colours, but monochromatic colours. There, it's only a single uh, colour of light that's hitting the sensor. There's no lens involved; it projects directly onto the sensor. So it's it's a very pure technical test to look at the the spectrum, the gamut that the the sensor is actually reproducing. And how much should, should people read into this? I think this is it's a good indication of what the camera is doing at the front end. It's a good indication of what the sensor is gathering. It's, it is a purely scientific test. It's not an aesthetic test. It doesn't really give us much information about the aesthetics, but it does give us information about the, the, the pure tones that the camera can reproduce relative to Rec. 709 or Rec. 2020 colour spaces, which are quite different. Yeah, every camera has a very complex digital, digital signal path. And Not to mention post-production. Yeah, but so this test is telling us what information and what range of colour information is being fed into that system. Yeah. Uh, what <laughs> the camera then does with it is a ginormously complicated piece of coding. Yeah, yeah. So it's not definitively telling us what the camera is capable of. It's telling us what it's starting with. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's have a look at that. We started with the FS7, what it is capable of doing, as again, as a benchmark for us. That's a picture That's of device. our monochromator, and here you can see the light broken down into its frequencies. Um, so the FS7 was, um, it was quite good, had accurate reproduction, especially in greens and blues. You can see it going well past um, 709 in the central triangle. Which uh, lots of cameras don't do. Yes. They don't do well in those necessarily. Um, but the FS7 um, did not produce particularly well when the reds get saturated. And Which actually, is surprising. 
and you can see, obviously, in Rec 2020, in that bottom right hand side, um, it's not not really a, even a, a, a go, a and it's even incapable of covering 709. Yeah, yeah. So a deeply saturated red color with the FS7 is going to be pushed to magenta. Once you get this sort of inaccuracy, you can make it challenging to get mm. accurate warm tones, especially if you want to preserve your greens and blues. Yes. So that makes the DSP work that much harder. And I will let those warm tones where skin sits. Yeah. Okay, so let's push on to our FX9. And I've got to say, we're all a little surprised by the result here. Obviously, um, has excellent wide production in the greens, um, better than any other camera that we've put this test through. We've put, we won't mention every camera, we put probably... Most of the high-end cameras. Most high, yeah, almost all the high-end cameras, yeah. through, I think. It's very good accuracy in the ranges of blues as well. That's not uncommon and with it, a lot of yeah, the other cameras. I think but there was, there was a, when we presented this here at the ACS HQ, there was an audible gasp in the room when Powell explained how significantly better this was than anything else he tested. Yeah. And you can see, especially when we look down here in the reds, obviously it's covering 709 with ease, but it's pushing the reds right into that far right corner. So the accuracy with which that camera can differentiate between different frequencies of red is excellent. And it's almost coming right into Rec 2020. The very far right, you see a little bit of um, shift towards magenta, um, but in Powell's mind, Tiny. that's easily correctable. But in his mind, the FX9 center was the best he'd seen in any camera in Full terms stop. of its ability yeah. to see color. Pure color. We also um, did a little test. We put a chroma key up. Um, with the FS7 and the FX9, we got both our models to wear green just to make it tough for the camera. So we just dropped this into Final Cut, did an automatic uh, chroma key without making any real effort. Both cameras did surprisingly, surprisingly well. The um, Obviously, we saw the green jackets the girls are wearing. The spill suppressor pushed them, uh, their hue around. Yep. Looks like almost 180 degrees. Uh, we then did a hue to hue selection i think it is mm -hmm. and we could push some of those greens back this is where the fx9 did better right which is FX7. probably that that um that it's tighter noise tighter noise and is... better color accuracy yeah yeah uh but the fs7 did well and there wasn't a ginormous difference between the the, the, the chroma keys in this particular situation yeah so we've only just sort of scratched the surface here this is just sort of a oh, sort of an overview have, yeah. and there's yeah. a lot more comprehensive tests if, if yeah. you want to look for them online absolutely the alistair chapman yeah. cvp cvp.com check those out really in-depth functionality of the cameras and all, all that sort of overview yeah. Is, yeah. is there so in terms of sort of a, a wrap-up how would you summarize the fx9 I, I, look i think the big things in the fx9 is we're seeing full frame sensor the color science, that high-end color science from the Venice, and the autofocus, these three big headline features coming into a package and the functionality of the FS7. And I think for anybody who's comfortable with an FS7 and likes the FS7 and wants those features, it's a no-brainer. It's, you know, that's, that's where it sits. Yeah. And anyone needing to step up from an FS7, it's a very logical step. Um, or as someone looking for something to a company, say a Venice or an F55. Yeah. So would you say it's there. a fair in-between solution between people who want something better than FS7 but don't have the money for a Venice? Um, absolutely. Look, to be totally honest, I think it's even clearer than that. Um, uh, presently, when we're doing this video, FS7 is about 9,000 USD. Uh, the FX9 is coming in 11,000. The, the, the FX9 uh, is... It's such an obviously superior camera at at every level uh, that I, I personally would, if I was buying a camera, I would not buy an FS7. Um, it's a fully, it's a capable camera. And frankly, if you want to stay with Super 35 and you're not interested in full frame, you've got a thing against it, you don't like it, then Or if you had camera. a pool of FS7s and you needed another one, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you already got, you already had them. Um, but if I was buying a camera today and I was looking at the FS7 and the FX9, for only that small amount of money, I know that my work would look so much better on the FX9 than the FS7. That would be a help for my career, clients, because people are just going to look at stuff, especially if yeah. they're clients who are just looking for stuff straight out of the box. So they're going to be looking at the cine tone, they'll be looking at colour tone, 
uh, skin tones and people are going to look handsome. They're going to look good straight out of the, the box. I think the autofocus alone is probably oh. worth the extra. No question. I'm super excited by the autofocus. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a that's got a long way to go to really cross through the entire industry. But we're seeing the crest of a wave Absolutely. in the distance, yeah, and we yeah. if, you can see if it you coming. were an FS7 owner, would you pull the pin and upgrade? I would. I would. I, 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 I would wait till there was a project that justified it. Yeah. yeah. But you know, there's, it's a significant step up. But would you upgrade? Just because that's there, it it certainly doesn't invalidate the FS7 as a workhorse camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but but generally on a on a much broader note, the the the, the FX9 is an indication of just how quickly technology is moving. Yeah, yeah. Only literally a year or two down. ago, this was serious, cutting edge stuff. Autofocus was not even was a joke. Yeah, it's certainly here we not are. something that's there on the high end cameras at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got full frame, we've got a whole bunches of other, imp- we haven't talked about, a whole bunch of other improvements, all moved up another peg on this camera yep. uh, and all at an amazing price. The other thing as well, I guess, is uh, like you, you as a, a Monstro owner, um, the Ven- uh, sorry, the FX9 is a completely different type of camera. Yeah. So yeah. it's a different philosophy, f- different design philosophy, design so, philosophy yeah. and you know, it, so it's 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 a different type of work that you would do with an FX9 compared to a, a, a digital cinema camera that doesn't have things like the autofocus features. Yeah. And for all my enthusiasm for the FX9, I, FX9 is not going to be shooting Hollywood dramas. No. No, no, no. It'll low budget a dramas, lot of for sure. Low yeah. budget dramas, absolutely. Reality yeah. TV, yes. corporates, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You could do a low budget movie and, and it'd look good for a high end doco. I think there's a Fantastic. lot to be said for it. Like lot as a camera said. to be travelling with, as a camera to be doing long interviews with. You know, there's, snow, there's, ice, yeah. heat. Yeah, the sun need to eat it up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I would say this is definitely our perspective. It's our first impression of a pre production model. It's, I think, the beginning of, of getting to know this camera uh, and, and it's definitely, we, we've gone for qualitative rather than huge quantitative analysis yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, but I think we, what we're seeing is that there's this camera, it fills a niche in the market. There's a, there was a gap there that this plugs. Yeah, and you need to, the camera's coming on the market now, um, you really need to get out there Grab an FX9, shoot your own stuff, see what you think, and uh, good luck.